Welcome everyone to our FinServe Roundtable discussion. Um, this is a follow-up from a previous webinar that we had uh, that discussed how to secure CFO buy-in um, during this economic uncertainty. Uh, it was a great webinar that we had and we're excited to kind of dive deeper into it with the audience that we have today. Um, this is being recorded, so uh, you will be sent a recording of this as well. Um, and any questions you have, please type it into the, the chat window. Um, these are some housekeeping rules. So uh, it is a smaller group. This is a round table. We're hoping to encourage participation. Um, we'd love to hear how you're doing things. So feel free to turn your cameras on if you so choose. Um, but if you'd like to not do that, that's also fine. Um, questions and comments are encouraged. Um, and as mentioned, it's being recorded. Okay, so to kick it off, I'll have Ariel and John introduce themselves. Um, Ariel, would you like to chat a little bit about who you are? Hi, um, I'm Ariel Perez. Um, I am the VP of Engineering for uh, Experimentation and Measurement at Split. I've been here now for the last uh, seven months or so, but um, I've been part of this industry uh, for quite some time longer than that. Great. And John, how about yourself? All right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Hey, everybody. I'm John Capoletti. I'm the CFO of Split. Uh, I've been with the company for a little bit over four years, um, and my background has been in finance and operations across both startups and uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, but really enjoy uh, the journey I've had so far with Split. Um, and uh, looking forward to today's discussion. Feel free to, you know, ask away. Um, I'm based in the Bay Area uh, and um, just got back from a great trip to see customers in London. So it's good to get out. John has a much I better intro than I do. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so what we'll do is we're going to kick off with a bit of a summary from last webinar. If you have not seen that webinar, feel free to go to split.io slash webinars. All of our pre-recordings of other webinars are there available to watch as you choose. Uh, so John, we're going to ask you to do a quick recap from the last webinar. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Elizabeth. So um, one of the things that we talked about in the last webinar was, you know, when you're engaging with the C CFO, um, you know, you you will likely have a lot of conviction about the investment you would like to make, whether it be in a project or a tool. Um, and um, you know, this is just a little bit of advice as to hey, how best do you partner with that CFO, uh, with she or he on on getting their support. Um, and so I kind of just caps encapsulated into five sort of takeaways. You know, the first being. Um, you know, know when to ask, right? Uh, timing is is very important. Um, for most companies, there's a natural um, cadence or rhythm to planning and when investment decisions are being made. Um, and, and you'll probably hear things like, well, the company's annual operating plan is in this window, or they tend to make uh, quarterly, you know, adjustments in this time frame. And so just get, um, you know, just being made aware of, you know, what, what is the, the rhythm or cadence of your company in terms of when that those planning and investment decisions are being made. The worst thing that could happen is, you know, the AOP, the annual operating plan is locked down. And then the next week you're sort of um, trying to bring forward an investment. It's like, well, it's a great idea, but we've already earmarked investment in other areas. So that's the last thing you'd, you'd want to experience. Um, second would be is um, really to relate your, um, you know, proposal um, back to the, the key metrics of the company. Um, so in any um, company's, you know, business model, that's, you know, how they're going to make money. Um, there are key metrics that are looked at um, across all facets of that business model. It could be metrics around your revenue, right? Um, it could be things such as, you know, what's your conversion rate from free to paid or your revenue per account? Um, what are your customer retention rates? So if you can align your, you know, tie back your um, proposal back to a, a fundamental uh, set of metrics that could impact the company, um, that's really going to get the, the ear of the CFO. Um, thirdly would be is um, just, you know, 
that really take some time to think about the discrete investment, right? That um, you know you're asking for. Um, the CFO is going to be, you know, I wouldn't know if they'll be grilling you, but they're really going to want to understand um, that discrete investment. What's the uh, what is it in terms of potentially headcount that's required or program investment? Um, what's the timing of that um, investment, and, and how long is that investment going to um, be required? Um, and then fourthly is would be is you know when can we start seeing that return, right? Um, and and often um, you know a CFO will will really push on the um, how realistic your assumptions are, right? So if you say that hey we're going to require a bunch of investment and by the way we're going to start seeing a return next week you know they might like push back on you and say well are those really you know reasonable assumptions that you have in place so just give a sense you know give, give some thought to okay you've got a re investment requirement the timing associated with that um, pair that with a reasonable or realistic assumption around when you're going to see that return and how is that return going to play out and then um this can really help you the last one which would be um uh, can you tie um, how how your project or investment is going to impact ultimately the financial statements of the company, right? So that is the you know the recipe that a a, a CFO is using as to how their um, impact um, how their business model is going to play out over time, and so the the more you're familiarized with the company's financial statements, for instance, their inc the, the a company's profit and loss statement. Um, versus, let's say, their cash flow statement or their balance sheet um, is is going to help you sort of get the buy-in from the CFO. So an example would be, um, you know, you intend to bring forward a project that's going to to really improve, let's say, your card conversion rate um, or your conversion from free to paid. That's going to impact your revenue, right? Um, and um, Conversely, you might have a project that is actually going to improve your infrastructure costs. Uh, let's say you're a SaaS company that's hosting, you know, your infrastructure on AWS or Azure. Um, you know, those costs, if you, those improvements that you're going to be make, making around efficiencies are going to play out in the company's gross margins, right? So there are different areas of financial statements, for instance, the P&L. Um, or you might be, for instance, improving um, the ability to collect cash from customers, right, based on a project that you have. Well, that's going to impact your balance sheet and your cash, as well as your cash flow statement. So um, just get situated, a little bit oriented to the company's financials, and your, your finance business partner can help you, you know, with that. Um, but it'd be very important to tie back your, your ask to, to the CFO as to how it relates to the financials, ultimately. Awesome. Pause Thanks. There. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, we also had Ariel join in the last webinar. Uh, we had, and this is from the perspective of engineering, engineering teams, and there were some takeaways from that as well before we dive into a deeper discussion. So Ariel, would you like to go ahead? <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, so uh, we had a few key takeaways uh, when it came to thinking about how we can invest as, as smaller companies, especially, right? Or even small groups within a large company, how we can invest like the big, large banks of the world, right? So what are they doing during a downturn? They're actually investing. And it doesn't mean that they're just throwing money willy-nilly, right? They're focusing that money on the things that will drive the most impact, the things that'll allow them to come out of this downturn, not only prepared to take advantage of the new opportunities, but also much more lean and mean when it comes to you know coming out of the downturn. Uh, so the the big key pieces, especially in financial services, but also in other highly regulated industries, is during the downturn, take that as 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 an opportunity to learn and to practice how you can start moving like smaller, newer, more nimble organizations. So even these big lumbering large orgs, they tend to get this is the downturns are the time when they get practice and the ability to say. What are the things that make small organizations nimble? How do they make decisions? How do they move faster? This is the time to practice that and get really good at that. In short, while you're biding the time and making it to the improvement in, 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 in the economic climate. And the last piece is that don't wait till tomorrow, start today. Start today immediately 
trying to figure out what is the right solution for you. And if you're worried about, can I spend money on this? Can I invest in that? There are many companies and many solutions out there that have freemium models that allow you to start taking a look, right? And start playing with things and trying to understand, will this have an impact? Can this improve? Improve us, will it improve our margins? Will it improve our costs? Will it improve our revenue? Will it improve our ability to move faster? If so, that really starts building that use case into the things that um, John was mentioning before, you get much closer to the idea of securing buy-in. So start investing in things that are ideally free to get the value and understand the value so that then you can start making the case on why we should pay for this thing. Awesome. Um, and if you've just joined, we also went over um, the top five things from the CFO perspective. Uh, this is being recorded and we'll be sure to share it on our webinars page. Great, so this is time for us to open up the floor. We have a few questions that are being provided ahead of time that we'll run through. John and Ariel are open to answering those questions, but we also would love for anyone who's participating today to unmute themselves, respond to the question. Um, we're really here to learn from each other. Um, so we'll offer our perspective and we're interested in learning yours as well. Uh, so the first question we had for today was, has anyone found tools that have been helpful in establishing ROI? or have you used anything internally to assess ROI? Um, so we're happy to kick it off. So Ariel, um, is there anything that you've used before? And you know, in, in other roles, I didn't necessarily have anything that made it easy for me to figure out ROI um, or basically no calculators of sorts or spreadsheets that we had. But one thing I was able to do was lean on something that I think A, is easy for an organization to understand and definitely easy for the CFO to understand, which is headcount, right? If I can turn the things I'm looking at in terms in terms of headcount, right? Either A, how much headcount we can reduce, or more importantly and ideally, how much headcount we can reallocate from this area to that area, that tends to kick off that conversation and get your CFO's ears perked up, right? Because headcount is a continuing ongoing expense. It is one of our biggest expenses. So we can think about how to either A, save on that or better allocate that headcount to something else that's more valuable, then absolutely that gets your CFO's ears perked up. So I think that's usually one of the first things I go to an ROI calculator. Let me turn all the things that I know and turn that into how many people. Um, that also may, you know, turns it almost always into an apples to apples conversation. Awesome, John, do you have anything to build off of that? Yeah, I mean, I think ROI some, a lot of times can be seen as, um, you know, something that a lot of people don't understand, but it could be, you know, really demystified, right? At the at the in its essence, you know, an ROI is is simply, you know, what is the benefit or return of an investment, right? Divided by the cost of that investment. So you could look at it a very simple way, and and look at it as a ratio. So. For every uh, dollar invested, you know you return three dollars um, from that. You'd have a three x or three hundred percent, you know, um, you know ratio and, and percentage. Um, there are more sophisticated models, right? And I, what I would say is that, you know, um, some companies that are more sophisticated might be looking at, you know, discounted cash flows. So projected flash cash flows, uh, you just dis discount that back to today's. Uh, value, um, and you can see what the return is. And what I would just suggest is you can probably find models, you know, out on the internet. But you know, more importantly, um, you probably have, uh, you know, a business partner inside of the company that can help you, you know, with that ROI model if if you need to get to a more sophisticated, you know, view of return. But I would start with, you know, that simple view as to. You know what is your what is the benefit um, of that investment over you know quantified over a certain time frame relative to that cost, and and start with that ratio as what do you think that that uh, ROI is going to be is it you know one and a half x two x three x you know return. Cool. Um, we did provide an example in the chat, so take a look at that. It's the ROI calculator that Split specifically built. But as mentioned from both uh, John and Ariel, there's a lot of ways to determine ROI. So if you have any suggestions you'd like to share with us, um, please comment in the chat or let us know. Um, 
The next question we have was, uh, as a mid-market company ourselves, uh, what do we look for when we're investing in new tools or potentially further investing in the existing tool stack that we have? Um, and this may be something relevant to any of the people attending as well. Um, how do you look to invest in tools? So um, Ariel, uh, how about you take a look, a start off on that one? Uh, absolutely, thanks. Um, in the current climate, I think one of the challenges that that any company has in breaking through to a potential decision maker or a potential um, a potential partner inside that company. Uh, the challenge they have is most companies, if not all, are very, very focused right now, right? Downturns um, become a very, um, uh, a forcing function to make people focus on what's most important. What's the most important thing that I can be doing right now? You know, we're really searching for efficiency. We're searching for productivity. So because of that, I'm focusing on the biggest ways I can move my company right now and have impact. So for you to get past that and, and cross that hurdle enough for me to even open your email or listen, in, listen to your email or for your message on different marketing channels to make it to me, the argument has to be extremely compelling. So what I look for, at, at, the first thing is I'm not looking unless it's a specific problem I'm trying to solve. So I'm trying to cover it in two places. If I'm not looking, but you're trying to reach me, you have to get to me immediately within the first few lines of what I'm seeing on, oh my God, that is so much value. I, I have to look at this and go deeper. So that, that's the number one. What I look for is a compelling, compelling ROI argument that I cannot um, ignore. Now, while I'm also diving deep and looking at my the, the things that can make us efficient, I'm absolutely looking for things that we're very slow at or things that we're not uh, effective at or efficient at, places where we spend a lot of time without a lot of output or outcomes. Those things to me, as I'm looking internally, they stand out to me. And then I start looking for potential solutions that make it easy for me to do that. Obviously, as I said before, those solutions that come up and are either free, free to try, or especially very easy to integrate and get started with, those also jump up and bubble up to the top of my list. On top of the fact that they already show or seem like they can solve the problem that I know I have, if they're easy to integrate, have maybe an amazing team that makes it easy for me to get started and get going and are potentially free to try. And there's so many ends here, but and um, are easy to learn where either the product is very simple and easy to use or has like a really great LMS program that my team, my people can learn. All these things add up to it costs me nothing to try this. And it's really easy for me to try this and see the value. Right. So that's what I look for beyond the I think it solves my problem, too. Great. Um, John, is there any procurement issues yeah. that you'd like to discuss? Uh, so let's say Ariel, you know, he's got, he's done his due diligence, right, on, on a vendor um, from a technical standpoint and a fit for his engineering organization. You know, I will, you know, as, as CFO, you know, I have to wear a number of hats, one of finance, one of legal uh, and procurement. Uh, and one from an infosec information security standpoint. And so I, I look at a number of things. So first being um, vendor you know reputation, right? Um, and and how easy are they to do business with? Um, and a lot of times you can learn about that through your uh, through your network. Um, and and depending on the size of the company, you might have to look at, um, you know, their financial stability. Are they, if they're a smaller company, a vendor, are they backed by, you know, tier one investors? Um, you know, are they, another thing I, I, I tend to look at is how do they approach pricing? Um, some vendors can be very transparent with their pricing and the pricing axes that they use. And some, some vendors may not be very transparent. And it really comes down to, um, you know, do you have a good sense as to what is that predictable, you know, consumption cost going to be over time? Um, and that is really important. Um, and, and that is actually really important as well when you're looking at sort of when it comes up for renewal, you know, do you have a, a sense as to how your costs are going to grow over time? Again, back to that ROI, you know, argument and business case that you made you know, is that um, cost expectation playing out as you had predicted in your original ROI uh, business case? 
Um, the other area I, I would say is, um, you know, compliance is becoming um, more and more important um, as, you know, data is, becomes pervasive. Um, and um, there is um, rightfully so just much more of a focus on data privacy, right? Um, and so I would really look at the, the information security capabilities of the vendor that you're looking at. Um, and you might have help from, you know, a, a business partner inside of your company um, to help you look at the information security, you know, practices that a company has. How do they approach a privacy? Do they have certain certifications? So, for instance, if they're a SaaS company, you know, are they SOC 2 or ISIS 27001 certified? Um, you could take it, you could have, you know, your technical team look at their, um, you know, penetration tests, you know, most companies that have to go through certification also are required to do tests to see, you know, what vulnerabilities they have with inside of their um, environment. Um, and you can ask for those um, tests as you're, as you're looking at a, at a vendor. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to kind of existing tools, when it comes up for renewal, um, the one thing I would suggest is, you know, are you in, in working with your procurement or finance you know, organization, if you have them, um, is are you in a position to get um, marginal cost improvements in your pricing? So as you grow, you know, with a vendor, um, are you getting those benefits in terms of your uh, price per seat when you get to the next level, or next tier um, of licenses or, or based on usage? Um, and, and this comes back to that pricing transparency. Do you have that transparency um, and predictability in, in your um, in, in your model? Um, so those are the areas that I would look at um, when I'm looking at a vendor. Great. Um, this is going to focus on the engineer side of things. So I'm not sure how many people that are here right now are on the engineering teams or leading engineering teams. Um, but during this current climate, how have you been able to show value? Uh, whether that be in a tool you already have um, that you're trying to keep or potentially a tool that you think would be necessary to uh, maintain growth during this stage. Um, I would love for anyone who's attending to, to provide their feedback on how they were able to show value during this time. Um, and in the meantime, um, Ariel, would you like to respond to that one? Awesome, yeah, um, I'll take a stab at it. Uh, one of the things that happens with uh, engineers, um, and it's been going on for a long time, it's this idea that engineers only really know about building stuff and programming and technology. And historically, we haven't been often included and brought into the, the product decisions, the business decisions, the business strategy. So unfortunately, we don't have always have the big picture. Now, thankfully, the industry has been changing and adopting, uh, evolving for quite some time, realizing that this results in suboptimal decisions and suboptimal uh, choices. The best, you know, the best teams tend to be like those that work collaborative together cross-functionally to come up with solutions. But with that said, right, assuming that most engineers generally only know about the technical aspects, that's even a great start, right? And do not feel daunted by the fact that you might not know the exact business drivers. You might not know the exact financials, all those product metrics that have the most impact on your growth, on um, retention, et cetera, et cetera. Even just starting on the things you know is a great starting point. So as engineers often we'll realize, hey, well, this thing is a problem that we have and it eats up 30 minutes off of every engineer, every engineer every day. You can add those minutes up. You can add the cost of an engineer and that gets you to a number, right? That's one way to get there. Or this particular problem means we have an incident that occurs once a month. We know for a fact that it occurs once a month or twice a month, and that number is increasing. Every incident means either A, losing money, or B, losing customers, or both of the above, and brand reputation. You can figure out and come up with a number or a range of numbers around how much incidents cost you, both from an external perspective, but also even internally. Here's how many engineers have to fight that fire for this long. If we invest this time, we can save those fires, we can save that engineering time, but also save that reputation cost. So we can focus on the things we know, performance metrics, monitoring, alerting, all the things that we build all this automation around. If we can improve on that and crunch those numbers, that's a great starting point. And that's where you bring that to your CFO or your business partner. You talk about, hey, how do I tie this to business metrics if we need to make the ROI bigger? Thankfully, here's the thing. 
many of our CFOs and many of these companies have to be versed in technology as well. It ends up being one of their biggest costs. So odds are they'll know what you're talking about and you might not have to do that next translation layer. They'll know how much engineering time costs the company. They'll know how much these incidents cost the company. But the key thing is you have that lingua franca. Focus on the things you know. Don't stress too much about tying to business. In that conversation with the CFO, you'll work that out. And that's how you'll come up with that idea of um, defining the value of this particular change or this particular product solving your problem. That's great. Um, definitely like focused on the partnerships and not being daunted. Um, is there anyone in the group that can add to the chat? We'd be happy to share those thoughts too. Um, but yeah, from building up your argument, uh, I think you've made some great points. Um, okay, we did have another question um, from the previous webinar, which is about building up your stakeholder team. So in the current economy, um, there may be more stakeholders interested in the process of purchasing. Um, so how would you establish or assess this team um, to make sure you're getting the most valuable um, buyer's decision possible? Um, I don't know who wants to start. John, Ariel, do you have a response to this one? Um, I, I can start on this one. Uh, and I know Great. John might have other things to take over and say, well, I got this wrong. <laughs> um, but uh, never, but, never. <laughs> it's, or, or you're like Ariel, yes, and. <laughs> um, so a lot of the things that I, you know, often you know the key thing to realize is you have to find who has the opportunity and the power to make the financial decision to invest in this thing, and that's not always easy depending on the size of our org. Obviously, the smaller our orgs, the easier it is to find that person. Regardless of who that person is and how easy it is to find them. A, the argument has to be compelling for them. So when you have to put together the things we just talked about before, right? I have the value. It's a massive opportunity. Here's the improvement. Here's what it costs. Now you need to get it to the right person. In a big enough place, you start, the, the main idea is you can't go wrong socializing it. Go upward to your manager, to the closest person that you work with. They might be able to find and have more connections upward to the right people. It's also practice because you have to convince your manager. If you can't convince your manager, you're going to have some challenges convincing other folks, right? Not saying that your manager is the end all be all and that's not where you should stop, but it's a good proof point. Work on, you know, talking to other peers, right? Because if you see this problem, odds are other people also have this problem. So the more people that have this problem and are talking about it, the better your chances that this is going to get to the right person through some venue or through some channel. So the big part about it is start talking about it. Talk about it to everyone who will listen, to everyone who you think might get you somewhere. And also, hey, look, there's nothing, there's nothing that you'll even lose by trying to reach that person directly. Yes, there's some office politics involved sometimes in some places, but even if you try to reach a person directly, I do find that many people on the leadership side are looking for ideas, are looking for the, you know, for everyone to really come up and reach out to them. Sometimes this is that idea that they're looking for and saying, it never filtered through me through the chain of command. Thank you for reaching out to me. So don't be afraid to also reach directly to that decision maker. Okay, John. Yeah, and I, I would I would say that um, typically the company that you work in, uh, there's a supporting cast of stakeholders that are going to help you make that um, decision on that investment. Um, if you're looking at a vendor, um, for instance, um, often there's a sort of a natural workflow that that occurs um, where you're putting forward, as as Ariel mentioned, is putting forward a business case to your manager. And often are pulling in, let's say, a finance business partner that is looking at, okay, the, the business case is there. Do we have budget for it? Yes. Okay, check. We've got budget for it. Well, then you probably want to pull in, um, let's say, folks that are, let's say, have expertise in uh, either procurement or information security, where they may do a vendor review as to um, the capabilities of the of the vendor. Um, are there any risks as it relates to information security that they should be aware of? Even before you get into sort of negotiations and, and contracts, you're going to want to get a sense of, is this the right fit um, uh, in terms of, of the vendor's capabilities and their information security? Um, pulling in procurement, um, if you have the, a procurement organization, they'll typically will take the lead on negotiations, which is fantastic. 
if you if you don't have a procurement organization, you know you can work with um, either run point yourself on that negotiation or work with let's say a finance or, or legal business partner um, that can help you there. And then finally, um, what I'd recommend is there's typically always going to be a legal resource that you're leveraging to um, ultimately negotiate the terms of service um, between you and the vendor. And um, what one thing I would stress is it's it's probably good to pull them in earlier um, than you might think. Um, the The legal process can can actually take some time, and it's getting more complicated. So, as an example, if um, if you're working with a vendor that's going to be basically hosting your data, um, there's a lot of um, contractual negotiations that often happen. Um, you might, in addition to a terms of service, you might have a data protection agreement. Um, and really need to understand their privacy policies and such. And that might take some time. So pull in the, your legal experts to help you with that um, because you're, you're probably thinking about, okay, I want to get started with this project. And on this day of the month um, where a legal person may say is, well, hey, it typically takes you know X number of weeks to potentially negotiate this. You just want to make sure that you're not surprised in the end that your project can't start when you expected it because um, you didn't necessarily pull in, you know, the stakeholders that you needed. Now, the, the, there's typically going to be a, a um, you know, process um, of, that you're going to be able to work within. So you're likely not going to be starting from scratch. Um, so you'll be able to, to leverage uh, stakeholders that you have in, in the company. Um, so just figure out how you can get um, plugged into probably an already existing process that's in place. Cool. Um, well, there's lots of good points being made in from both Ari and John about this. Um, what kick started this conversation from Split was in noticing that um, some articles were written about JPMC, who are lately investing more and more in their tech and engineers um, in a down economy. Um, so a question that came from that is, you know, are they now growing a gap between smaller companies or growing feature sets um, that other people are taking a break from during this economic downtime. Um, so something we wanted to bring up on this one was how can companies um, ensure that they're staying competitive whilst we're seeing other companies investing and, and doubling down. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a large topic. Um, so I will post it in the chat as well and look for responses. But um, if John or Ariel want to discuss that further, love to hear your opinions on it. Um, the first thing I can say that, especially as mid-market and smaller companies, like I'm gonna separate between that and enterprise. Often the biggest thing you have going in your favor versus like a JPMC is you can move faster for many reasons, right? You have less stakeholders, less people to get it, get it on a decision, maybe less paperwork, less processes in general, right? So you can move faster. And that's what, that that alone is a massive um, uh, advantage that you have over a, a JPMC. Even though JPMC has a lot of resources and a lot of money to put at something, it takes them a long time to get it done. So that's one massive thing that I think you can depend on and lean on, especially as you're mid-market and SME. If you're an enterprise, what I would suggest is also think about those same ideas. What are the things, what are the processes, what are the, what is the bureaucracy? What are the things that you can ideally cut out or reduce while understanding your risk and your risk posture to allow you to move faster, right? Make better decisions faster and fail faster and quickly. Those are things I would you know, suggest for like an enterprise company. All right. Well, John, any, any insight into that growing gap as a CFO? Yeah, I think Ariel nailed it, though, um, just in terms of uh, the biggest competitive advantage you could have is the ability to move quickly, right, and to iterate. Um, and having worked for large, um, you know, Fortune 500 companies, to Ariel's point, is sometimes it's very difficult to move quickly within that environment. Um, so you need to, if you're working for a large company, get creative. Um, it's okay to fail. Um, as long as you fail fast and then iterate, you know, from there. Um, and so even when you're thinking about, okay, how do you put together a business case, you know, 
don't overwhelm yourself with, you know, what does it mean to put together an ROI or to get approval? Um, often you're going to have, you know, folks inside of your company that are going to want to partner with you and to move as quickly as possible. Um, so don't be afraid to, you know, move quickly. Um, and don't be afraid to ask, um, not only one for investment, if you've got a great business case, you know, your, your um, peers um, and management are going to want to support you. Um, and they're going to want to support you in moving quickly. Um, and so just, I would just, those would be the two things I would, I would take away. Great. We did have some um, feedback from this previous question and um, that there's also ways to start quickly. So look for uh, tools that you already have existing in your tech stack. So what do you have that you can lean more into? Um, but if you'd have found a gap and you are looking for a new tool, um, is there a freemium version of the product? Can you pop on into the product, uh, give it a try and know that you can build out that ROI yourself? Um, so those are a couple pieces that came through. Um, also to see immediate results um, or immediate value. Um, also looking for the, the quickness of scaling your system. So if you're bringing a system in, potentially having an LMS system in place that allows you to educate your team at a greater scale. Um, so we will actually post a few of these tips um, at the end of the webinar and we'll be sure to put that through. Uh, we are coming to the, the close. We're at 45 minutes or we have five minutes to go. Um, we did have a couple other questions to ask, uh, but if there's any on the floor as well, please send it over to the chat. We'll give it a, a couple of seconds and then I will bring up another question. Okay, one of the other questions and maybe a good way to wrap it up <laughs> is a piece I just touched on actually, which is how to start seeing value immediately. Um, regardless of the size of your company, as, as John mentioned, you want to fail fast um, and iterate often. So is there a way that you can start seeing value immediately within your organization um, for any tech that you want to bring in? Um, uh, Ariel, engineer side of things, what do you think? How, how have you shown value quickly? Um, I think you mentioned several of the tips, right? You know, and I talked about this before. Anything that's freemium, uh, easy to learn, easy to use, and potentially has support can bubble up to the top very fast. But sometimes, you know what? It's easier to get more out of an existing product or solution than trying to get a new one in. As we've known, especially at big companies, it can take a long amount of time before you can get a new product in. You might want to look around at the products that already exist and can they help you solve the problems you have? Because at the minimum, you've already gotten those through the door. So the, the hurdle is much lower. Uh, the hurdles are much lower and the barriers are lower. And you might be able to get value out of that much faster. Plus, you already have a relationship. Plus, you already have the contracting in place. So that's something that you can potentially look for and say, let me leverage that to see value sooner. Cool. Yeah, we had someone write some feedback here, which is also being able to leverage pre-existing relationships. Um, RL, you did mention that before. So do they have existing integrations that work? Um, do they have partners that you already work with? For example, um, we're available through multiple different marketplaces, different partner marketplaces, which would add zero dollar to the cost of your spend. Um, but you get to see some some products that way too. So thanks for that. And John, how about yourself? Um, as a CFO, what do you expect to see immediately? <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it comes back to that business case, right, which is there was likely a um, an implementation plan that was an underpinning of that business case and what the cost, um, you know, expectations were going to be and the investment expectations. And so I think you just want to sort of tie it back to um, are you tracking to your project plan? Um, and there, there might be other things that, you know, let's say a CFO or IT um, organization may look at, which is, you know, are you tracking to that pro project plan? Um, are you, you know, utilizing the product um, as expected? Um, and so a lot of times, you know, teams will have the ability to take a look at utilization, right, um, against uh, entitlement. Um, so there's a lot of different things that you can look at to see if you're tracking towards your, you know, your project plan and your, your expectations. Um, I, I would say that that would be one thing I would, you know, look at. Um, and then ultimately, 
is, uh, you know, are you starting to see the benefits play out, you know, as you expected? So a lot of times we focus on the cost. Are you executing towards, you know, you know, your deliverables, but are you starting to see that return play out? Um, if those want to start saying, hey, are we starting to see the return as expected relative to our initial assumptions? Um, and if not, you know, there might be a, um, you know, consideration around, okay, is this the right vendor? Is this the right solution that we're going with? Or did we fundamentally have, you know, a different set of expectations that isn't necessarily playing out and, you, and you'll go ahead and iterate and pivot from there? Cool. Yeah. Well, I mean, thanks both of you for your insights. Um, we will be sharing the recording. We'll email it out to you. And for those that weren't able to attend, they'll also be receiving it. Uh, if there are any questions in the interim, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can contact us directly at info at split. Um, otherwise, also feel free to connect with John and Ariel. Um, it was great having this discussion over the last few months. I know we're all uh, looking for solutions and understanding how best to get the most out of what we have in place or when we're trying to find new tools. So we appreciate that. Um, thank you all. And we will conclude the webinar today. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Thanks, all. Thanks.